So welcome to um, returning to our original goodness. So I'll just talk for a, a few minutes about what I mean by that. And, um, you know, I, I've been talking for a long time in, in my workshops and my courses and the summits that I do about um, uh, that about our, um, I can't even remember the other word I use, original goodness, but, uh, but, but we were all born with an innate goodness. And I think that um, one of the things that happened back in the third century, St. Augustine said, uh, oh no, we're born with original sin and people are bad and they need to be controlled and they're, if they're not controlled, they'll do bad things. And of course, for the church, that was a, a great way to, to uh, control people, to get taxes, and to justify genocide of Native people, many other things that happened. But it's a lie. We aren't born essentially bad. I mean, anyone who's ever looked at a baby when it's born cannot say that baby was born bad. I, I've never exactly. seen a baby that looked like it was going to, you know, rob me or, or, or murder me or something. We're not born that way. And so, you know, the question I want to explore with you all is, what happened? How did we get into this mess where we're so divisive, so separated, so afraid, so many things happening that are destroying our habitat and all life around us? And uh, what do we need to do to return to that original goodness that we were born with? Our, basically, I used to call it essential goodness. Now I'm because of the original sin, I thought, no, this is original goodness. This is the actually right term for it, uh, because the other is embedded in our consciousness, in the language, and uh, our ancestors and our historical uh, uh, field that we are living in. And so that's a question that my whole life I've been looking at as a trauma survivor, um, and my work is really looking at and integrating those parts that we had uh, major incidents that caused us to shut parts of ourselves down. In, in the shamanic and mystical traditions, they call it soul loss, that some part of us uh, gets hurt and then freezes. That's not a bad thing, that's a very good thing. That's the product of a vastly intelligent nervous system that is actually able to know when it needs to shut down some part of our essence, our essential or a goodness, our essential self, so that we can continue on. And so when you look at the very early development, I think uh, many of you are familiar with the idea of attachment and the difference between a secure and an insecure attachment. And But I'll just say something about that because it's so uh, important. Um, so we come into the world with essential goodness, but we also come in with parents or caregivers who have uh, both familial and cultural baggage that they carry. It's interesting how many people I work with these days are the children of or the second generation of people that experienced the Holocaust or you know, World War II, how much this gets handed down in our psyche and in the field and what is that about? And so what I've been really interested in is this whole, how do we develop from being essentially good? What happens to us? Do we, do we become bad or do we become broken? Do we need to be fixed? And my answer to that is that there is nothing wrong and that we don't need to be fixed. And all these things that we're doing to fix ourselves, in many ways are keeping us stuck in uh, these patterns that we have. And I can say more about that later, but just to look at the essential idea. And the example I wrote about, maybe some of you read in uh, one of my letters that I sent out, the example I gave was of when we're born, we have caregivers. Sometimes they're not our parents. Sometimes we're adopted. Many, many things happen there. But just uh, in terms of the nurturing of a mammal, uh, of a human mammal, that 
we develop by being curious because we're born with a sense of wonder and curiosity. That's one of the things often we lose in terms of soul loss. And how that works is that uh, the, the baby or young child goes out and meets experiences and then to be safe comes back and gets soothed and nurtured and that's how we develop a good structure. So um, in the way of the mystic, I talk a lot about energy uh, and uh, structure and movement, uh, the aspects of how we develop. And so when we go out and do that and something happens, so let's say that um, a two-year-old is, is crawling around and, and just starting to talk and connected, you know, and exploring and goes over and, and gets um, uh, too close to the dog's food. And the dog goes, bark, like that. And the baby goes running back to mommy. It's mommy, mommy, I'm scared. The dog barked at me. The dog's going to eat me. You know, mommy, mommy. And, and so then mommy says, come here, sweetheart. Come here, you know, come sit on my lap. And so baby crawls up and mommy puts her arms around and says, it's okay, sweetheart. Do you know that sometimes I get scared too? And it's okay to be scared. It really is. And all the time kind of soothing and touching the baby and, say, and maybe whispering in its ear, you know, and humming a little song and just really. And then the baby says, oh, it's okay to be scared. Okay. And then it goes over and starts playing with the dog. And that's, that's called secure attachment. Then imagine another, and this, I don't mean this to be gender biased, but let's say the same thing happens. Um, baby goes away and daddy's just come home from work. He had a really hard day at the office. He had a couple drinks afterwards. He's got a lot of work he's got to do. He's got to figure out how to pay the mortgage and the bills. And, and the baby's just crawling around and goes to the dog, goes bark like that. And comes running to daddy. He's, daddy, daddy, I'm scared. I'm scared. And daddy says, go. Don't bother me. I'm really busy right now. No, I'm really scared. The dog's going to eat me. And, and daddy says, come on, grow up. Don't be such a baby <laughs> to the baby. Don't be such a baby. You know, grow up. There's nothing to be scared about. Well, what does that do then? Suddenly the child is left with my, my caregiver, my survival says that there's nothing to be scared about, but I'm scared what's the decision that's made at that time? Something's wrong with me. And then we begin to develop, well, what is it that's wrong with me? Because I'm not gonna make my caregiver wrong because my survival is dependent on it. So it's always gonna be made, and this is how we, we develop with these, with these curiosities and then these confrontations that happen. And, and we don't get the nurturing and the uh, security and the soothing that we need as children. Now, even if you had the perfect parents, you're still gonna have these kinds of things happen. There will be a time when mom's got three kids and cannot handle another thing and, and barks at you instead of the dog, the mom will bark at you or something will happen. Um, so we have these, this intelligent nervous system. This is not a bad thing that this happened a very intelligent nervous system that shuts down and says, you can't make it if I don't shut this part down. So we freeze a part of ourselves. It could be our, how we be related to men or to women or to money or how we feel the world is safe or unsafe. All of these parts of us, we begin to freeze little parts of us. We become fragmented. So healing, I just did a thing for the Shift Network today about healing. What is healing? The word heal comes from the word whole. So when we're looking at healing, you know, for the traditional, or for the medicine, uh, the medicine community that we have now just says, take a pill. Well, that just numbs everything. But we are whole and we're fragmented. All of us have fragmented parts of ourselves that haven't been unfrozen. So what, what I'm looking at here to have a dialogue around to return to our original goodness is to look at, well, how do we unfreeze these frozen parts of ourselves that um, our intelligent nervous system said, hey, 
you know, I'm going to shut this part down until you're ready to deal with this. But the problem is in our culture, we have no initiation. We have no rites of passage. We have no way to go and be uh, given from adolescence to adulthood. So we actually live right now, and it's obvious if you really look around at the state of the world, we live in an adolescent culture. We have not, we have not reached maturity as a species um, at any age, as a culture. And so what I want to open us up to today is looking at, okay, how do I take these fragmented parts and reintegrate them into my life in a way that's safe and in a way that uh, allows me to uh, authentically and fully express myself? Because if we have a choice between um, attachment, in other words, that nurturing that we long for that we didn't get, which is in place of the frozen part, if it's a choice between attachment or authenticity, attachment will always win because it's our survival. And so how do we reintegrate those fragmented parts of ourself that are simply there? We're still whole, we're just fragmented. So again, nothing's broken. It's that we need to learn to um, self and co-regulate ourselves so that we feel safe enough that we can actually lean into and, and learn to love this. So in the way of the mystic course, which I hope all of you will participate in, um, I'm not gonna do a big sales talk uh, on it. Um, I, I can't stand the selling of, you know, you have to have this, you need this, uh, you lack something, it's really urgent, you have to do it. And if you don't, uh, and it's a, it's a $40,000 uh, opportunity for $49.95, I don't do that. Uh, just, but I really do invite you to join the Way of the Mystic, the one coming up in a week, actually. Because what we work with there is to develop a structure and the mystical path. When I say um, becoming a mystic or a cultural mystic, so normally we think of a mystic who is someone who goes off and sits in a cave and um, all, you know, meditates and chants and does all that stuff for 50 years, you know, and, and then reaches this uh, enigma called enlightenment or self-realization. But when I'm talking about a mystic, I'm talking about a cultural mystic. And that means that we use everything, everything that happens in our life as an opportunity for awakening and discovering wholeness in our own life. And so that's the path that I'm talking about. When I talk about becoming a cultural mystic, I'm talking about learning to integrate the fragmented parts of our life, the difficulties that we've had, so they are no longer running us and running the narrative that we think is us. So what do I mean by that? I teach three basic principles. I'm gonna give you a very short description of them because it takes seven weeks for me to teach them, but uh, uh, basically is presencing is the first one. And what do I mean by presencing? I mean zooming in, but where do I zoom in? I don't zoom into my mind, I zoom into my body because everything that has ever happened to us is stored in the body. This is our divine instrument. This is the way we receive our soul's messages, our soul's journey. But most of us have, uh, have had the, our, our mind, our brain has had a coup over our heart. So we have to get back into our body, back into our heart in order to integrate the unintegrated parts of our life. And you notice when you integrate these parts, that when you're around other people, it's infectious. You know, when you're around someone who's present, you can feel that. And it, it, if you're, say you're very nervous or uptight and somebody's very present around you, then they co-regulate with you and you begin to feel, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm here. I'm presencing myself. I'm zooming in and I'm zooming into my body 
Um, I'm getting something from Deborah, and I just, um, okay, it's just about her. Whoop. That's okay. You can ignore that for now. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Some messages are coming in, and I was afraid you were telling me that nobody heard me or something. Uh, which, you know, you could sit here in silence and maybe get it all, but it's better if I can talk a little bit too. So I was talking about the first stage of becoming a cultural mystic, and that is to presence yourself. And what I mean by that in the traditions, the mystical traditions are meditation, contemplation, and prayer. Those are the basic tools. Uh, and there are many kinds of meditation, walking, dancing, many different ways you do that. But those are the tools. They're tools to bring us into our interiority, to awaken us to our interiority. What does that mean? I physically really mean inside you. Because think about when you're feeling stressed and anxious and overwhelmed, which is a lot right now with all the fires and COVID and the US and all the things that are happening politically, economically, you know. And if you really feel into your body, you'll recognize that it's a contra there's a contraction that's happening. Stress, stress, st stress is a, a, a word that really doesn't mean anything the, the way it's used. Uh, it's like saying I have a cold, or, or it's like saying I'm sick, and is, do you have a cold or do you have terminal cancer? You know, it, it doesn't, it's just a spectrum to say I'm stressed or I'm anxious or I'm depressed. What it really means though, is something is too much. And you can feel that sense right now of too muchness. It's in the air, too much, it's just too much. I can't take any more. And that's because we're contracted in our interior landscape. It's an inner contraction. And if you can get precise, and this is where we go from presencing, we zoom into the body, we discover what's happening in our body, and we go to the second stage, which is called witnessing. And when I witness, and people who meditate, those of you who are meditators know this place, suddenly there's a time when you went, you're, you're uh, presencing yourself and suddenly you realize you're watching yourself. Well, who's watching you? You know, it's like, am I two people? No, it's consciousness itself is able to see what's happening in you. And so that sense of witnessing takes you much closer in where you begin to develop a felt sense of the movement and energy in the body and where the stuck energy is and where the the movement is and where the frozen and numb parts are and where the pain parts are and we begin to witness that and in the stage of witnessing we become more conscious of these frozen parts that I talk about. Uh, mo many of you heard me talk about frozen chickens, but uh, it's a good way to remember that. You know, you go to the store, you buy a chicken, you bring it home, you say, I'm not going to eat this till Saturday. So I put it in the freezer. It takes a lot of energy to freeze that chicken. Then it takes a lot of energy to keep it frozen. Well, this is your body. It takes a lot of energy to freeze those parts, even though it's the nervous system saying, okay, I'm gonna save you right now, I'm gonna freeze this part of you, but it takes a lot of energy. So if you're feeling tired and exhausted, that's the first sign of soul loss or the first sign that you have a lot of areas that you're trying to keep suppressed. We dissociate these parts of ourself. They're frozen parts of ourself. And so we have to go into them. And we go into them depending on how big the trauma was. You know, there's a thing called titration. We kind of move against it. We kind of touch it. We allow ourselves to feel a little bit of it and just notice, ooh, that's scary. I remember when that happened, you know, when my mother didn't come home and I was left all alone. I was so scared. And we, and we breathe into that and we feel that and it literally begins to melt and create space. It no longer becomes this frozen chicken and you know they're carrying all these frozen chickens. They integrate 
and we become whole. Rather than being schizophrenic, that's what my teacher Gabrielle used to say, you're schizophrenic, your, your mind is doing one thing, your heart is doing another thing, your emotions are doing another thing, and your body is doing another thing. We're out of sync, We're, and that's true for most people. So the second element of this uh, uh, practice that we do in the way of the mystic is to witness. Well, then as you witness, you begin to notice that these things in your body have movement and they have shape or they have frozen stuckness or they have color or, and, and you begin to touch into the felt sense. You get deeper and deeper into that inner sensation and you can, oh, ooh, yeah, there's something there. I can feel that. And, and then I begin to notice, mm, there's an age to this that feels like about five years old. And maybe there's a story, maybe there's not, but there'll be an age, a sense of an age, time. Like a, a five-year-old trauma is different than a 15-year-old trauma. They're very different in terms of how they are in your body. And so we um, explore that and we open to it and we find that, oh, there's a five-year-old that was scared and didn't get love, or there was a five-year-old that was in an accident and shut down, or there was a, a danger and um, you know it was fight or flight or freeze. Those things are all part of this system where we freeze parts of ourselves, And so then we go uh, into the third stage, which is embracing. And we, we acknowledge, oh, wow, I had this, thing that happened to me and it was really scary and it was around three and so i'm going to bring my three-year-old onto my lap and i'm going to put my in my mind's eye i'm going to put my three-year-old on my lap and i'm going to let it know sweetheart i know that thing that happened when the dog barked was really scary and that you know we were busy and weren't there for you uh and i i'm here i'm you i'm here now and uh, your parents were busy i'm here and I want you to know that I love you so much and that I'm here to take care of you and I'm here to hold you. And you can even, you know, feel that. That's really good if you have a cashmere sweater on, you know. I can feel that, that young child and I just give the child love. And it's simply by the loving attention, the loving presence. Presence is love. Presence is precision. I, I'm very precise about what I find, and I love that, and I then engage it. And that's what allows the ice to melt and the parts to be integrated. Okay, so enough talking now. I just wanted to give you a basis of how I work for, some of you know this and have worked with me, others. So I want to open it up for, um, you can look at the questions that I put out uh, in the flyer, which I don't even remember right now, but um, Deborah might be able to post them or something. Can you copy and post those, uh, the five questions? But just to, um, let's interact and have a dialogue and, um, get clarity around this and, and please use um, personal experiences of what's happening with you. You know, what you're experiencing right now, because this kind of healing is not the healing of the mind. It's not the healing of drugs. It's not the healing of fixing and getting more information. This is the healing of becoming more present to those areas in ourselves that want to be freed up and, and that, only we can free those those places, those parts of us. So um, please raise your hand. Okay, Michelle with an S is up. Uh, raised your hand. Great, Michelle. Hi. Hi. Oh, I just, uh, it resonated with me so much, uh, the first call, because it was, uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan. I'm still here, but it's one of the, uh, most religious provinces in in the country and uh oh until i started to get curious and question what my beliefs actually were um i was you know in that fear and uh so conditioned to feel not enough from that you know original sin message but um 
so the more that I questioned, the more I had to write about it. So I ended up coming out. I wrote in I wrote in secret for uh, a few years. I didn't tell anybody, and I came out through the book as you know not religious anymore. Uh, you know, much to my mom's <laughs> upset, <laughs> she's praying the rosary for me every day. I'm sure, <laughs> but but I I. I but got so frustrated the more I learned about what my beliefs really were mm -hmm. and how I'd been conditioned. I felt so duped. And um, anyway, so I had to write about that whole process, but it was um, so freeing, so freeing to finally mm -hmm. sort of remember who, who I am or who we are mm -hmm. and how much less suffering came with that as well just it was cathartic to write and and uh you know the fallout of religious family and uh community after that was was challenging but i had my voice and i owned it and uh, i'm still here i didn't get burned at the stake <laughs> but but it is it was uh you know a process sometimes painful but you know um just I had to have the courage to ask questions and to question my own beliefs, things that didn't ring true for me, especially when I saw my children and now my grandchildren, it, it didn't ring true anymore. So I just, um, uh, it was just a process of, of change and sort of evolving and, and moving towards self care and not feeling like I had to suffer for anything. Mm -hmm. or earn something back or earn love or and looking outside of myself for for um to be okay i was able to find that mm -hmm. within myself and and it just opened up so much once i set my religious beliefs aside that's brilliant i love that <laughs> i love that you bring up the issue of beliefs i think uh, that's a really important important issue because all of these early experiences do shape our beliefs and our culture, mm -hmm. our familial background shape the beliefs. And when we talk about beliefs, we're seldom present. If you're in a belief, you're not present. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm talking about presencing, and this is a big part of, you know, the work we do in the, in my courses, um, when you, when you're, when you're in a belief, you're in a story. And the story is called my life. And that's a narrative that we live inside of. And we have confused that narrative. And by the way, we're either in the remembered past or the imagined future, because it's never really the past. The incident that happens to us where we shut down is not the incident. You know, I've had many, many huge traumas in my life lots of death and uh, issues that are very large traumas. But it's not the trauma, it's the story we make up about how we relate to the trauma that gets us stuck. And that's the area that we're trying to free up. And also when we're talking about the future, we're talking about the imagined future. But we actually think that the past and future exist, but it never does. The only thing that exists is the present. And in the present, we have frozen past. Though That's exactly what those parts are. Those frozen chickens are just frozen past that we are still holding on to, and fear emanates from them. So these stories that we've been telling ourselves, something about our narrative that's really important to know, that we have a story, but we are not a story any more than I have a hand. I'm not my hand, and I have a hand. I have a story, but I'm not my story. But we act as though we are our story, that we really are. Now, one thing about the story is, the story has only one purpose. We also call it the ego, the story, the narrative, however you wanna name it, it has only one purpose. Anybody know what that one purpose is? Its own survival. That is the only, it's a uh, continuous tape loop that has only one, it, it, it embellishes its story. It, it you know, gets uh, more and more uh, uh, 
grandiose about its story and its fears and its ideas and its commitments and its beliefs and all of this, but it's a story and its only purpose is its existence. It's its ego, it's, it's its personality, it's the identity. And so presence is never belief. There is no belief in presence. Presencing is really bringing to what is happening in this moment right now. What's happening in my body? What thoughts are going on? What emotions are going on? Can I feel them? Can I get a felt sense of what's happening? Until we get to that place, we'll be on the treadmill of trying to fix this person who isn't broken. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks so much, Michelle, for bringing that up. It's a great, a great uh, mm -hmm. part of it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Who else has their hand up? Anybody else? Not yet. Anyone else want to jump in there? Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. I think I, I think that was an act. I didn't really have my hand up, but oh well. You want to interact with me about anything? Well, not now. I will. Okay. All right. I will. Yeah, that's good. So thank you, though. This is wonderful. Oh, thank you for being here. So what else uh, is up for people? Anything else you want to look at? Anyone want to work on anything with me to say, yeah, but what about this? Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Are you there? There, there I'm unmuting are. myself and, and lowering my hand. So bear with me just a second. Yeah. Um, I, for me, mm -hmm. um, it seems that with these issues that we are experiencing as a collective whole, um, tend to, um, it seems to me anyway, like this whole masking thing is very off putting and people then, um, don't even want to make eye contact with others. Mm. And so I have made this conscious effort in doing more random acts of kindness mm -hmm. and engaging with people, um, be it six feet apart or with a mask on, um, even like drawing smiles on the masks mm -hmm. and exaggerating my own smile because generally speaking, it hits my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to, in my small way, bring some life back into, I feel not myself, but I feel from others so much fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A and in um, what I spend a lot of time for myself is, is in the quiet because when I can feel myself close or I feel, um, the effects of what's going on, whether it, it's a new moon, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's mm -hmm. fires or uh, civil unrest or, or whatever, is to try to sit in, in the silence because obviously we are all interconnected mm -hmm. and try to breathe, if you will, in the silence for the greater good of the whole. Mm -hmm. Because I know as one person, there's, I, I do what I can do. Right. And, and I can't do it all, but if I'm mindful to be as kind and gentle as I can to those, because like you were talking about how many people have been injured or assaulted or whatever from their past and didn't get the soothing. So to go out of your way, to be the, to be the light, to be the soother, to be the smile, to be the engaged person and to hold that sacred space for others who may not even be awake enough to know that they are, are suffering. Yeah. And maybe That's they complete. are very awake and aware and just to sit there anyway. And just to realize that uh, it's a beautiful thing to help other people. Yeah, it is. It's, it, I love what you're saying. And, and I know you know this, but I'll say it to make sure that other people who are caretakers don't get locked into that uh, area because it's, it's really important that first you give that to yourself. 
you have to give that to yourself first. And I understand, but I need to say that for, for the listening sometimes is sometimes that becomes a clue. I'll take care of everybody else and not myself. I don't know, there's probably some people on this call that, that have that need to be of service and then don't take care of their self. The biggest thing we can do to bring about healing is to do our own shadow work. And um, if you don't think you have any, then you're definitely living in the shadow <laughs> because we all have shadow work to do. We all have inner work to do. And But what you're saying is so important, Lisa, because um, it allows us to co-regulate. Um, we have um, also an advanced mystics course that we do a lot of work together. It's a small group, what, 17, uh, Larry? Uh, 17 of us. And it's amazing. It's a six month course, but we work with co-regulation and the connection that's happened in three months is absolutely amazing. People, people are able to actually read, you know, we do this thing uh, as we start the, the calls, looking at ourselves, looking at the other, looking at us. So we create this opportunity to actually be able to feel the feelings and the sensations and the things that are happening with the other person. And what happens is a kind of co-regulation that that anxiety and that fear that's in the field just kind of comes down and people get, you know, people, most people would not ever miss those calls on Wednesday morning because, you know, it's, it's like where I come to get nourished and nurtured and to nourish and nurture at the same time. So it's not an individual kind of, um, it's so amazing community to be able to heal in community is a thousand times faster and more uh, penetrative. Is that a word? Penetrative, something like that. It's, it, it, it is so powerful to be in a community of pe like-minded people who are committed to um, working with their own shadow and having that be their gift. My gift to the world is my trauma. I wouldn't wish the things that happened to me on anyone, but I'll tell you, I am so grateful for the traumas that I had because I would not do this work if I hadn't have gone through all of that. All the nasty, gnarly, the alcohol, the drugs, everything, you know, that finally went, uh, you know, I don't know, where did I just do a, a summit? I've been doing a lot of summits lately. Oh, oh, the Shift Network, it hasn't aired yet, but I just did one on, um, a death experience, a time that I died and came back to life in the hospital. And there's that choice point that something happens and we say, I'm no longer going to have my, my suffering and my past dictate my future. And, and that's a kind of presencing. And then you begin to witness how it's been doing it. And you begin to integrate and embrace those parts. And you know, it's, it's really the discovery of your soul's journey, uh, that when you remove the obstacles, all you are doing is your soul's journey. Uh, and and uh, first we have to clear our vision of the narrative and the story to be able to see that basically, you know, we're the universe's way of seeing itself, which is pretty amazing, really. So, um, yeah. I kind of went off on that. Uh, anything else about, about that, though, that you wanted to say? No? No, I'm good. I appreciate you allowing me to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other hands want to just go up? Yeah, Larry. Say your name the proper way. I always get it tongue twisted. Lady. Larry. Lady. Like, see you later, but without the last R, later. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is, um, you know, you talked about death and there's a lot going on there. And um, I lost a lot of family members and um, uh, to be, um, Precise, I lost like one entire generation, which is like my father and his uh, three, uh, two brothers and one sister. And none of them got till 40s. Mm. 
and um, and so one of the things that I that I always wanted to work on was on that you know like I I think that I've um, went through all of yeah those uh, experiences when I was growing up and uh, the the biggest one was my father right and I think there was a moment in my life where there was an event um, that as a kid I created uh, well you know my mother just uh, brought me to have lunch to a restaurant because uh, she didn't know um, how to do it and and then she told me uh, your father is gonna die and and that was really really tough for me to hear you know and and I felt like that was mean <laughs> That was what mean? Mean, mm -hmm. like mean. That was like like that that hurt. So that was like mean from her, you know, to say that. Mm -hmm. um, so I made up that she was mean, and uh, that that was in uh, true, you know, and mm -hmm. that was true. Obviously, you know, like she just like needed to tell me that because that was coming, and she thought that that was the way, right? And how it landed for me was mean and uh, was really bad. And then I started to create my own belief system in terms of like, no, no, he's not going to die. He's not going to die. So I was like praying every night and, and even like creating games for myself and telling God, you know, because like mm -hmm. that was how I was like raised up, like growing up, like believing in Christianity and, and so I was like, God, please, um, you know, like just praying and praying and praying. Don't, don't take him. Don't take him. Like I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll, I'll give up on my, you know, like eating something or I'll give up on my, um, always really creating something for him to believe me mm -hmm. that I was capable of doing that if he will let my father be alive, you know, like just, Sorry for my English, but I'm just trying to. Um, and 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 then and then he died, you know, and and that was really painful. And um, and then I I think that I've been really repressing those like kind of feelings of like losing him, and um, there's a little bit of work, and I need to do that there with in terms with. Um, of like death and uh, growing up and and because uh, I'm 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 always uh, scared of losing someone and and now I'm letting go of our relationship and I feel like that he's gone you know so I have yeah um, a lot of sadness. that kind of like you know like I'm always letting go of people and Let's not speak. not letting go but there we go. you know what I mean. Let's yeah. Feel the sadness for a second. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Just let's feel it. Right. Allow yourself to have the sadness. That's good. Let's just keep your eyes closed there. Let's go back to this conversation at the restaurant. Okay. So how old were you? Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. All right. And so this is a different than a very early uh, trauma, but it is a definitely a trauma event. So you're sitting there and your mother tells you that your father's gonna die. And let's look at the story. So part of the story is that she's mean for saying that, but what's the whole, what happened in your body? What, what was going on at that time? 14, you just heard your father's going to die. You don't want to believe it. What, what story are you making up right there? I think the story that comes is that she's lying or, you know, she's, I don't know, that, that can't be real.
but I don't, I don't like really get the. So what were you feeling in your body at the time? Go back there to 14 because it's probably a feeling you had felt before that, but just notice what was happening in your body. Just imagine yourself sitting at the restaurant, your mother's there sitting across from you. She tells you your father's going to die. So just notice your body, what's happening. Yeah. I guess like this feeling of like abandonment too, you know, like, okay, got it. Like, yeah. Is that what you, I don't think that's what your mind said. You were sad. You feel, stay with the sadness. Let your eyes go closed and just stay with the sadness for a minute. Okay. So there was a sadness and you were upset with her because she brought you that sadness. And you decided she was either lying or mean. Yeah. Right. So we we have those stories so we don't have to feel that sadness. They allow us to go through the challenge of, oh my God, my dad's going to die. Instead of feeling that. And you shut down. So imagine yourself now going back to that 14 year old. I think I was kind of like upset because the way that she decided to tell me or something, yeah. you know, like in a restaurant, really like for me, it was like kind of like out of context. Like, like this is not a like business business meeting or something, you know. Well, just for a second, imagine. Do you think your your mom loved your dad? Yeah, they were separated at the moment, but yeah, they they you know they cared yeah. about each other. Yeah, they cared right. about each other. Now, imagine if you had a child and you were already in the middle of a separation and you found out that your partner who you still loved was going to die, how would that be for you? Can you repeat it again? Yeah. I just saying, put yourself in your mother's shoes that he or she has been through um, a separation and now she's finding out that a person she cares about and the father of her children is going to die and she's got to tell her teenage daughter and her kids that. Just imagine yourself in that place. Well, I had to do that with my brother too. That's another thing that when my brother was three, because my mom had another relationship and uh, had my brother. Um, his, his dad died in a car accident really suddenly. And so this is I had to. This, mm -hmm. is, this is right. You're getting to the originating issue here. So how old were you when your three-year-old brother died? Twenty. Oh, this was after. I thought that was before. This no, was, no, that was after. after. Yeah. Okay. So the, the point I'm trying to get to and the work to do here is, and, and there's almost certainly an earlier incident, but to, first of all, an adult perspective is to recognize what your mother was going through. But that's, that's the main thing to do is that you haven't fully allowed yourself to feel the grief and the sadness. You were pushing it away, pushing it away, pushing it away. Calling on God, calling on anything. No, don't let that happen. So you spent enormous amount of energy in denial about that. And what that was covering up is the 
fear of loss and the sadness that is right there. You, can, you, can you feel your sadness right now? Tell me where you feel it. Hmm. In my chest. Yeah, exactly. So now go, go into your chest now. And let's, let's focus a little deeper on it, not just in your chest, but exactly, see if you can precisely feel the movement of that sadness, of that grief in your chest. Breathe into it, hold your breath. <laughs> Does it have a color? shape drop down in into the sensation into the felt sense of it and out of thinking about it you're not going to find it by thinking about it go into the body yeah it is blue blue uh -huh. yeah and what shape is it The shape is not, I think it's more like a, like a spiral kind of thing. Uh -huh. yeah. That it's just like... So it's got a movement, it's blue and it's got a movement and it's in your chest. Mm -hmm. And say hello to that movement. Just say hello. Make contact. Now, you feel it? Mm -hmm. Stay in touch with it. Don't don't leave it. Stay right there with it, and with the sadness that's there. Allow that to just be there. And now, ask that blue spri spiral that's in your chest. Does it have something that it wants to tell you? It's got a message for you. What's the message that it has for you? And just be still, and allow it to come not from your head, but come from your chest. And to be just still and softly up, uh, notice it. Keep tracking it, keep being curious and just with the intention of hearing what it's trying to tell you. Feel it opening, just keep breathing like you're doing. Feel that expansion that comes. You're doing great, just touching into it softly. Listen with your whole body. What's that? What, what just came up? You're safe. Yeah. Say that again. You're safe. Beautiful. Feel that. You're safe and you're sad. So thank that part of you that's that blue swirl in your chest. Just make sure you express gratitude for it. Now the other, other part of that, there is, there's still forgiveness for your mother that you need to do. You need to let go of that. You're still holding on to a piece of that. So that's 
That's the work. You are safe. So mm -hmm. what, what comes up for you when I tell you that? Um, peace. Like, I feel like I need to be alert all the time. And then if I really... Well, the having to be alert is part of the trauma. Yeah, yeah. I don't... That's a reaction. But when I say that you haven't forgiven your mother yet, and that's the work there is to do. Mm. And forgiving your mother is to allow yourself to really step into the safety and the freedom. It's not your mother's fault that your father died. No, I know. But it's easy to th think that way. I, I blamed my father on my mother's suicide, but it didn't have anything to do with him. They were in a war, you know? They were bombed at Pearl Harbor. That was after I blamed myself <laughs> first. So yeah. that's really to recognize that you're safe and you're sad and now the work is to really let go of all resentment. And um, I forgot who mentioned death. Um, oh, you did, <laughs> that's right. But this is the kind of little death that we need to do every day. These are the kinds of deaths that bring us into the present. So anytime you have a thought of your mother having been mean or, um, thoughtless or whatever comes up, manipulative, all of those feelings that come up, you just have to, to allow that. That says more about you than her. That's the story that you made up. And that's what keeps you stuck in being not safe and not being able to feel your sadness and grief. You have sadness and grief that still needs to be loved. And so if I want to forgive my mom, like, I guess, like, simple as. You forgive the mom that's in you. We've done a lot of work around this. It's mm -hmm. in you. <laughs> it's not the mom out there. It's the mom in you that needs to be forgiven. And when you really do that, then you'll notice a, a much more spacious relationship with your mom. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and I know you need that right now. You want that. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I, I just say one more thing, um, because we've worked, done some coaching work together around your relationship, which, you know, came to an end. But it's also... I want to suggest that it's also related to um, your not having to be a caretaker in a relationship. So I'll just throw that one more piece out for you to work on. Mm -hmm. And you can bring it to the advanced, you know, course too. Bring that in as something to take to another level. I'll take it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the Thanks willingness for to do the work. And that's such a good example of what it takes to do this kind of inner work is to really explore and go inward. Now, just to ask you, Lyra, just to ask you, can you feel the spaciousness in there? I can feel your spaciousness over here. Doesn't that feel, can you feel that in your body? Describe what you feel in your chest right now it's it's more it's lighter it's just and the breath is is more um is easier to breathe <laughs> yeah yeah it's beautiful so we've begun to integrate that now it doesn't just go away like that it'll come up again 
And but that just gives you an opportunity to go deeper and deeper and continue to integrate that frozen piece. So you've actually demonstrated beautifully how we move up against something, we love it, we open, we presence, we witness, and we embrace, and we love that part. And, uh, and in doing that, and loving is precision, loving is presence. Loving, love is presence. I can't think of a better definition for love than presence. Don't we all want to be seen and heard, and, and many of us have a lack of feeling, uh, a, a sense of feeling unseen and unheard? So, thank you. Nice work. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, appreciate that's, how, that's the kind of work that we do in, in uh, both the Advanced Mystic and the Way of the Mystic course. Um, so what else, what comes up for people that you'd like to um, um, ask? And, and Deborah, did you put those questions up there? I don't have an, any idea what they are right now because you know, I tend to be in the moment and not remember stuff. Yes, yeah, I, I did post them. So the first is how do we meet our emotions in a healthy and empowering way? Second, what role does faith play in meeting the challenges of our time? Third, can we cultivate kindness and courage in times of crisis? The next is how can we come together in common unity in a culture of separation? And lastly, is it possible to complete the past and integrate the fullness of lessons learned? Mm. Wow. Brilliant. Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Um, yeah, I do want to say uh, just one thing, and please raise your hand and let's have some interaction here. But um, on thir is it Thursday that I'm doing the new moon call? Every month I do a free new moon call with um, a thought leader, a mystic, a shaman, an elder, something like that. So I'm with my friend uh, Itzhak Berry. I laugh because he's just such a delight to be with. And we've had great fun in Ecuador and Peru. And um, just uh, uh, he's um, runs the New York Center for Shamanic Studies. That's not the right name, but uh, the Shamanic Center in New York City and just a delightful person. So we'll be really looking at faith. Um, as opposed to the belief of faith, but actually what is faith? So that's one I hope you'll join us uh, for that. But any other questions or any questions about the way of the mystic uh, course, if you're interested in doing that. By the way, you can, you can always book a 15 minute, if you're interested in a course and you wanna see if it's for you or you wanna intro, just go to welloflight.com and book a session with me. There's, 15 minute sessions that are, are free and you can, you know, talk with me and see if it's a fit for you to be in the course. And I have extended until tomorrow night, I have extended the um, um, early registration um, fee. So it was supposed to go up, I think Friday, but I decided since I'm doing another of these that I'd leave it till tomorrow night, so. So what's alive in you? What wants to be spoken? What wants to be embraced? What wants to be uh, discussed, held, explored? Mm. It's really more powerful for me to work with you. I can talk forever and, you know, that's a terrible death to be talked to death. So I'd rather interact with you. So. Somebody want to jump in there and, and just uh, either a question or something that you'd like to work on. We've got, you know, some time to do some work. Um, I always find that doing the work is more powerful. Tammy, I see that you there. Are you wanting to do something or ask a question? Hi. Um, I... Yes, I would, but I'm, I've been in this space, I guess, um, of just wanting to release everything. And that includes all questions. And <laughs> I do want to do the course. I'm also a teacher, so I'm teaching at that time. 
Yeah, but interestingly enough, I have my um, prep periods. I don't know. Anyway, so that's kind of where I am right now in the space of letting go. And it seems like the harder I try to let go of everything, the tighter my body's getting. Mm -hmm. Like my yeah. heart feels like it has a like a shield in front of it, a metal one with rivets and holding it. And I fell again when I was walking the other day. So I know I just whoop, fell. Yeah. So <laughs> my body is speaking very you brought loudly. up such a great issue i just ha i'm so glad i'm so happy that you brought this issue up the inner issue of i have to let go so <laughs> that's that's uh, excuse me i'm not going to say this personally but that's one of the biggest <laughs> ego trips that we have I, that I, in my largesse, am going to let go of the very thing that I created, which makes me keep creating it, or I wouldn't have something to let go of. <laughs> yes. So um. it needs to be loved, not let go of. Mm. It just needs to be held. Those parts of us that we want to integrate or change just need to be seen. It's awareness that does the healing. It's not your mm. identity. It's not your ego. You don't change your mind with your mind. Your mind has one, mm. as I said, one purpose. It's survival. So this, this is how spiritual bypass and all these ideas, you know, uh, that, that people have and they get stuck in this place and it becomes a complete ego trip. Oh, I'm very spiritual, you know, and we mm -hmm. go around, oh, you know, like <laughs> this. And it's like, no, no, let's get real here. Where is it in your body? What needs to be loved that hasn't been loved? Find those places that are screaming, but they mm. scream very softly. You know, like mm. Larry says, I'm sorry, Lara. I cannot get my mouth to do that D in there. Please. No, no you're doing well. You do well. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but that, you know, that message has been sitting there for years and years, wanting her to know you are safe. You are the source of safety. Safety is not something outside of you. You are safe. You are safety. But she couldn't hear it because of all the other noise that was happening. So it's so perfect mm -hmm. what you're saying, Tammy, that, you know, what there is to let go of is letting go of. That's the only thing there is to let go of and just allow things to be exactly as they are and exactly as they're not. But we, we burn our energy, we burn ourselves out. You said you're tired. Yeah, you're probably exhausted because you're trying to take it all on too. It's not just like one thing I'm trying to let go. I'm trying to let go of everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Every piece of chicken. <laughs> Every piece of chicken, yeah. <laughs> You a bit of a perfectionist? A bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about perfectionism for a second. So mm. perfectionism is really a, uh, a disease and it's about control. It's about not wanting to lose control. And, you know, in my work, I invite people to lose control. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, I know. I know it's miserable for a perfectionist. No, I can't. But, you know, did you have any control over COVID? Did you have any control over the wildfires? Do you have any control over being born? You don't have any control. It's a myth, the idea of control. What there is to do is embrace the uncertainty. Then not only do you, it's not that you don't have an intention to make something happen. Of course you make things happen. You do, you make something happen with your intention, but it's, it's, it happens in the moment. You're not out in the future making it happen. And then it might not happen. And if you only want that one thing to happen, then all the other mass of potentiality in the universe gets missed and you focus, oh, I failed because I didn't get this perfect. When in fact, you know, 
uh, I, I love many artists, uh, painters, rug makers, uh, porcelain people, many great artists, they always leave a flaw in their work. Mm -hmm purposely leave a flaw in their work. And, you know, so if we can celebrate the flaws in our life, David White has a wonderful poem. We used to work together. And uh, David has this poem, uh, Faces of Bragan, in the last line, it's a very long poem. Great, great poem, if you want to look it up too. It's a beautiful poem uh, about perfectionism too. Um, and letting the, the, uh, grain of the carvers, the hand of the carver follow the grain of the wood or something. But it, in the end, it's, he says, until we, uh, let me see if I can remember it. Oh, I've got a, I've forgotten the last line. Until we, uh, um, mm. boy, I just forgot the last line of that poem. Until we, something of death, gather all our flaws in celebration. Deborah, could you look that up? David White, um, Faces of Braga, the last line, the last little bit there at the very end of it. Thank mm. you. Deborah's on the team. Uh, uh, well, of life. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. So, yeah, I appreciate that. So the point I'm making, though, is that there's, there's this, this perfectionism, which no wonder you're tired because you know it, it it's not possible it will never be if you're looking for perfection it can never be f perfect the only way it can be perfect is by embracing the way it is then it's perfect because it's the way it is but if we're going for perfection we will never live up to our ideals and that's really important because when we're trying to live up to our own ideal of who we're supposed to be, we're always going to be suffering. And not only that, if, if like our partner or our husband or our wife, uh, that we, we, we have this thing about there's an ideal, my ideal, there's my husband and there's my ideal husband. <laughs> and as long as there's the ideal husband, the other husband <laughs> is always going to fall short. And it's really a trap that we get into and put this not only on ourselves, but on other people, this perfectionism. But it's, it's simply about the fear of losing control. And someplace, one of those frozen chickens, I promise you, Tammy, is someplace <laughs> where you were out of control and it was just too much. It was just overwhelming. Do you remember a place like that from early on? Hmm. Probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's something, you know, if you don't now, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But um, ask for a dream about it, uh, mm -hmm. meditate on it, something like that. But I promise you, there is that place. And that's a, that's a huge weight to let go of. To mm -hmm. really, you know, you, you do your best, you set an intention, but you really allow not just for it to come out, the way you'd like it, but for other possibilities, other learnings, because the path of the mystic is using everything that comes up, the trauma, the drama, the losses, the grief, everything, not just some things, but everything as the path to awakening. We say these issues that we come up, like people, I teach meditation. We also have a meditation Saturday coming up, which I'm adding to the course for the way of the mystic, by the way. So it's an extra bonus to do the Saturday med meditation on October 3rd, something like that, October 3rd. Anyway. Um, October 3rd. Okay. So where was I going with that? Um, just the expectations we put on ourselves really cause us so much suffering. Um, and to embrace uncertainty, uh, Heather Ash and I, Heather Ash Amar and I did a, um, a new moon call on that last month on embracing uncertainty and the importance of that and um, how that leads to uh, um, this vast opening to worlds we never even imagined were possible. So, yeah. Anything else, Tammy? Thank you so much for, and, and for being a teacher. I just want to honor you as a teacher because uh, teachers and mothers are the two, to me, 
most important professions um, on the planet, and and they're also the most underpaid and underrecognized. So I just want to recognize oh, you. you for all the teachers and all the mothers. Too. Are you a mother? Mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. So you, you get double double acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So we got a few minutes, and mm -hmm. I don't see any hands up. This is an interactive program here. <laughs> Who's sitting on something that you really want to ask? I'm, I'm here to be support. I'm doing these calls. If you want to, can, you know, a lot of people wanted this call and I'm surprised out of all the people that wanted the call, you know, so few showed up, but I'm, I'm just here to be supporting you. So if there's something that you want to say, please raise your hand or just unmute yourself and speak up. So anyone here, you can wave. I'm looking here. <laughs> Cynthia, anything you want to say? Well, actually, I have a question, uh -huh. I guess. I am in constant pain, mm -hmm. and I thought I had just given permission for it or accepted it, but every day it is a challenge. And um, I just do not like taking painkillers. And it comes in and goes, but really it's pretty constant. Mm -hmm. And that's a real issue. It's very difficult. And um, it started out needing a, I started out needing a hip replacement and things came up where it had to be delayed due to a leg problem. And then I was healing the leg problem and the doctor was transferred. It's been like a series of events that has prevented me from going forward. And I don't know what I am doing to prevent it, but it's a, it's a real struggle. Yeah, you I get it. Yeah, you meditate and you are meditating. You are meditating? You are meditating? I am meditating Good. and I've been asking for answers and I've been journaling. Mm -hmm. And um, I I feel like I'm just stuck. Yeah, and no, that's I get that's it. okay. But <laughs> I get it, Cynthia, and and I don't want to underplay. Pain is um, a really challenging teacher, and it is a teacher, but it's a very challenging teacher. Um, and there's much we can do with pain. Um, we can stop trying to change it so much and try to really focus, uh, soft focus again on locating exactly. And we tend to do this with our head rather than with our breath and our attention. So if you're a, a meditator, then you'll understand this. You really want to go into the pain and allow yourself to fully feel it. Um, I wouldn't beat myself up and say it's my fault or something like that. It's just the conditions that you have. Uh, that would be a waste of energy to just say, why, why am I causing this? Uh, I, I'm not of the new age. You caused everything. Uh, that's, that's a spiritual bypass uh, that I see a lot. But you need to love that pain. Um, I can recommend my friend Mark Nepo's work. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend it. Uh, Mark is a double cancer survivor, and he, um, um, I remembered the line as you found it, Deborah, until we growing younger towards death gather all our flaws in celebration. Sorry, I, I, I got a sense. Is that, is that right? Isn't that the way it ends? What is his name again so I can look at that? David White is who I just quoted. But Mark Nepo is the cancer survivor, and he's written about 25 books. And I've probably done a half a dozen radio shows with him over the last 10 years. Um, and he's a brilliant elder, uh, and he's written a lot of poetry and prose both. He's a brilliant writer. Um, and... Um, I find it very soothing to hear how he's been able to de deal with just excruciating pain of cancer. Twice he went through it uh, to where it was just, you know, 
uh, one image that comes to mind from his writing is, is uh, having this horrible pain and then being able to be with the pain, but at the same time look outside and see, I think it was an Oriole or a bird outside the window and how it just relaxed his whole body. Um, uh. But, but you know, his, his, um, he's someone that I, if, if I'm having pain, I read his poetry or I think about, you know, what he's talking about. I also have some pain in my life that I, that I'm dealing with. And um, thank you. Yeah. I'll look him, I will look him up and do that. Thank you yeah, very much. N-E-P-O, Mark Nepo. N-E-P-O. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope you join us for the course. It'd be lovely to have you, have you with us and probably very helpful. Well, it sounds really, it sounds really wonderful. I am looking into it. So yeah. Uh, De Deborah, did you put the link up for the course for people? I put the link up for the course for okay. the one day and for your seven day. Okay. And, yeah. And I added uh, Mark Nepo's name and his link. Great. Thank you. Did I remember it correctly? The last line of Faces of Braga. Uh, well, the last the last line I got was our faces would fall away until oh, we. Oh. Oh. That's right. I, I was before the last line, wasn't I? Until so growing younger toward death every day would gather all our flaws in celebration to merge with them perfectly, impossibly wedded to our essence, full of silence from the carver's hands. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. It's been a long time since I <laughs> quoted that poem, but um, that's called Faces of Braga. Uh, by David White, W-H-Y-T-E. It's a wonderful poet and friend, um, as is Mark. So uh, we're coming towards the end here. And, um, you know, I just really invite you to join us. And I, uh, I send out a fair amount of newsletters and writing, and uh, I hope it's not overwhelming, but I'm just passionate about this work because I know that our individual healing is what's going to bring about the collective healing. And so I'm really passionate about the work I do. And um, as people who work with me know, I'm very available. So, um, you know, please, please do uh, say that. And I do wanna, in closing, uh, say that we have done work here tonight. And uh, first of all, I invite you to take whatever's come up for you to your dreams tonight and have a pen and pencil by your, a pen and paper by your bedside. But uh, I also wanna dedicate this work to all the people that are suffering in the world, that our work on relieving the suffering and integrating into wholeness is what will change the work. It's not the world, it's not the work we're gonna do out there, which is important if you're doing that kind of work, but it's really the inner work that allows us to self-regulate and handle our own fear and our own uh, grief and all the things that we're dealing with so that we can, uh, uh, that becomes infectious in the community and the cultural field. And so I really um, invite you to, um, uh, to send those prayers out to everyone, particularly so much suffering and all the fires and uh, just people who were homeless and without jobs and people suffering all around the world. So we dedicate this poem, this, this uh, hour and a half to them and may they be peaceful and may they be healthy and may they be at ease and may you be happy, healthy and whole and at ease. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm so grateful for the time we've spent together. And I look forward to uh, seeing you sometime soon in the next week's The Course, if you wanna join that. Uh, to, Thursday is uh, uh, Itzhak Berry and myself talking about faith. And that's a good one too. Um, Cynthia, I would definitely recommend that one also. About okay, thank faith. you. Yeah, it's a good one. And uh, and then the course next week, and then the meditation uh, weekend, uh, the Saturday meditation, mini meditation. So thank you again. And uh, thank you, Deborah, so much for being there to post things and keep an eye on me and remind me to turn the recording on and all the great things you do to support people.
So much love to you all. And uh, I will see you soon, I hope. Thank Bye you friends. and God bless. God bless you. Thank you so much. Many Thank blessings you. to each and every one of you. Let's see, how can I unmute everybody? Not sure. <laughs> it says mute all, but not unmute all. So I guess I won't be able to have you all say goodbye, but thank you so much and bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good night. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.